Hello, this is Muriel Rand, and today we're going to do a quick tutorial on writing lesson plans for early childhood literacy lessons. Let's get started. The first step is to check your standards. There are two sets of standards that we use in New Jersey. For preschool, we use the New Jersey preschool standards, and for grades K, 1, 2, and 3, we're going to use the Common Core State Standards. You don't need both of them, you just choose one or the other depending upon the grade level that you're working on. Choose only one or two standards to focus your lesson tightly. I know some people might disagree with me and I've, I've heard some professors say throw in all the standards that could possibly relate, but I disagree. I think it's better to have one or two standards so that you know exactly what you're trying to accomplish, your lesson is focused and clear. And it's much easier to, to then write your objectives if you know very clearly what your one or two standards are that you want, you want to work with. So let's go next to the objectives. You're going to ask yourself, what do you want the children to learn? You're not focusing on what you want to teach. That will come next. The first part of writing a good lesson is to focus on what you want the children to learn. Well, how do you know that? From the standards. That's why you're going to start with the standards. The standards will tell you what the children should be learning at each grade level. Now, once you've figured out what you want the children to learn, you're going to narrow it down a little bit. The standards are a little bit more broad, and your objectives are a little bit more narrow. So ask yourself, what will the children be able to do as a result of the lesson? That's your objective. Make sure that that objective is aligned to the standard, and once again, just stay focused on one or two objectives. Now the next part about your objectives is how to write them. You're going to write in measurable behavioral terms. Let me explain what I mean by that. Here are some examples. We want to word the objective in a way that we can evaluate it. So for example, we would say the children will be able to identify the rhyming words in the story. We can see whether they're able to do that. We can observe them, we could um, give them a checklist, we could, we could use a rubric to evaluate this, but anyway, it's observable. It's something we can see. It uses the, the uh, verb to identify in the sentence. Here's what's not a good objective. The children will understand rhymes. We can't see understanding. So we have to take understanding and then change it into a verb that will show us what the child actually does that tells us that he or she understands. So in this case, I've used identify. The children will be able to identify the rhyming words in the story. It's usually helpful if you start your objective with the children will or the children will be able to. Now, I've still had some students who write the children will be able to understand. Just don't ever use the word understand. Don't use the word know. We can't see understanding. We can't see knowing. Think about action verbs. Here's another example. The children will write complete sentences using proper capitalization. We can see them do that. We can tell that they are actually doing that. That's a much better way of writing it than the children will learn about capitalization because we can't see them learn, but we can see them write. So we're going to use those action verbs in the objectives. You're also going to make sure that your objectives um, have some other characteristics. So here's a checklist to go through. First, do your objectives directly relate to the standards for the lesson? That's where we started. Second, are they appropriate for the age group or ability level of the children? For the most part, the standards are going to help you figure out whether they're appropriate for the age group. But perhaps you're working in an inclusion class in which you have some children who are at a lower level, or you're working in a gifted and talented school in which some children are at a high, higher ability level, so you're going to want to make adjustments in your lesson plan. Are they written in measurable, observable terms? We've discussed that already. And also check to make sure there's only one or two objectives that are focused on throughout the lesson. So that objective should be seen in everything else that happens within the lesson. Okay, now let's talk about the materials. This is the next section. This is easy. All you do is you just list all the materials that are needed for your lesson. Why do you do this? Well, because the lesson plan is your guide so that when you're starting to teach a lesson, you can just quickly look at your lesson plan and see, oh, I need this book, I need these materials, I need these markers, I need um, this booklet. Whatever it is that you need, you're going to have a list so that it's easy for you to gather all of those before you start the lesson. 
if you have a book in your lesson, put in the complete citation. That way you can use your lesson again in the future and be able to get that, that book easily by um, going online and looking for it or going to a librarian for help. Okay, then the next section is the introduction, which is sometimes called the anticipatory set. Your introduction is designed to connect this lesson to previous knowledge, to what the children have done before or what the children know. You might have to give them some background knowledge. Perhaps your, your lesson is going to use a story in which there are, there are some vocabulary words the children don't know. You're going to want to introduce them. Or perhaps your story relates to a field trip that you've just taken and you'll want to uh, bring that previous knowledge in and link it to this new lesson. Your anticipatory set should also motivate the children. This is the hook. This is what gets them interested in the lesson and, and paying attention, essentially. Because we're working with young children, all of the anticipatory sets that you create should be hands-on. In other words, there should be some type of materials or actions that the children do. And it should be multi-sensory. This means give the children something to look at, something to hear, something to taste, something to feel. Have them move around. It should be multi-sensory. Not a discussion. Why not a discussion? Because children do not learn by sitting and listening to each other. Older kids can do that. Younger children don't learn that way. Younger children learn by doing. So make sure your anticipatory set is hands-on and multisensory. Um, please do not write an anticipatory set where I will discuss with the children what they did at the farm. No, 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 no. Instead, you're going to have them act like farm animals or show them pictures of the farm animals or have them make sounds of the farm animals, um, march around the room like the farm animals, or actually um, bring them to the farm, of course, is the best. Okay, so after you've got your anticipatory set all worked out, next we're going to go to the actual procedures that we're going to use during the lesson. The procedures are the main portion of the lesson, and this should be a step-by-step -step description of what you will do, what the teacher does, and what the children do. This is designed to help you think through how everything will work in your procedure. And we write these long lesson plans when you're, um, when you're preparing to be a teacher to help you learn to think like a teacher. So that's why they're so detailed. Teachers who are more experienced don't usually put all this detail into their, um, into their lesson plans. They usually just have a very brief description and the objectives. But because you're new teachers and you're learning how to teach better, you're going to go step by step and write down everything that's going to happen in this, in this lesson. Make sure that these procedures are focused on your objectives. If you say that your objectives are to teach the letter M, make sure that in your procedures you're actually teaching the letter M. Um, so again, make sure those are, those are perfectly aligned. Also take some time to think through your classroom management. Is this going to be a whole group lesson, small group? Is this going to be something that children do in centers? What are the transitions? How are they going to move from the rug to the desks? Or are they going to be sitting at the carpet? Um, where are you going to be relative to the children? The more you can visualize what's going to happen and write it down, the smoother your lesson will be when you actually carry it out. The next section, which is really part of the procedures, but we, we um, pull it out just because we think it's important, is to give opportunity for guided or independent practice. So think about how the children will be able to use or practice what they have learned in the procedure section. This could be independent work, it could be seat work, it could be center time work, but in general, the way we all learn is first we observe something, it's modeled for us, then we practice it with some, with some guidance, and then we practice it independently. So think about that three-step process for your lesson. First you model it, then the children have some guided practice, that means that they're doing it while you're helping them, and then there's some independent practice. So in your lesson, I want you to add either guided or independent practice after the procedure section. The next section is to the check for understanding. Basically, you're going to think about how you'll know whether your objectives are met or not. Did the children really learn? This is actually an easy section, but a lot of people um, get confused. 
Basically, go back to your objectives and just reword them as questions. If you said the children will be able to learn the letter M, then here for check for understanding, you're going to say, I'm going to observe to see if they learn the letter M. So you just take your objectives, reword them as questions. Also think about the method that you're going to use to assess those questions. Am I going to observe? Uh, maybe we'll just take anecdotal records. That's what we <coughs> typically do in preschool. We might use a checklist or a rubric. Suppose your lesson is on writing. You're probably going to end up using a rubric to evaluate the children's writing. Perhaps it will be a quiz. Um, if you're working in second or third grade, you might have a quiz on the material at the end of the lesson. Whatever method of assessment you want to use, think about its appropriateness for the age of the children and for the lesson itself. The next section here of our tutorial, I want to show you a sample storytelling lesson plan and see how I've used this lesson planning format to create an effective lesson. This one is going to happen, just happen to be a preschool lesson plan, but the formatting is exactly the same if you're using kindergarten, first, second, or third grade. So we've got the subject area, which is listening and emergent reading, and we've got the grade level preschool. The title of the lesson is Mouse Pain. So the first part is the objectives. And notice how the objectives are written in measurable terms. The students will show interest and pleasure in the story by mixing Play-Doh and participating in the storytelling. We can see whether they do that or not. See, we could have written the students will enjoy the story, but how do we know if they've enjoyed the story? We can't see enjoyment. We, we can only see actual behaviors. So we've taken enjoyment and we've created um, behaviors that show that they've enjoyed it. The second objective is students will be able to identify the letter M and the sound that it makes. Now, where did we get these objectives from? We got them from the standards. So I went back to the preschool standards and I looked at what I really wanted the children to be able to do. And you'll see I used 3.1.4. Um, all of Section 3 are the literacy standards in the New Jersey preschool expectations. So these are show interest, pleasure, and enjoyment during listening activities by responding with appropriate eye contact, body language, and facial expressions. So you see how this is a little more generic? I've taken this more generic standard and then I've made it more specific in the objective. Students will show interest and pleasure in the story by mixing Play-Doh and participating in the storytelling. And then we've got 3.3 um, A3. Identify some alphabet letters, especially those in his or her own name. Well, I've chosen the alphabet letter M because it goes really well with the book that I'm going to do called Mouse Paint. All right, let's see how we do the anticipatory set. The materials are going to be the book and the supplies. And notice that I've written a lot of supplies in here. And you'll see as I go on how those supplies are going to work. So the book, notice that it's the complete citation so that somebody else can get it or I can use it again as a reference later. And notice with the supplies that I've included every single thing I need in all of the materials for the anticipatory set, for the procedures, for the um, guided practice, everything that I need for this lesson is one list here. So that before I do this lesson, I can run around and gather all of these together. Okay, so here's the anticipatory set or introduction. I will gather the students together for circle time. I will give each child three small pieces of Play-Doh, one red, one yellow, and one blue. I will ask the children to name the color for each piece of Play-Doh given to them. The children will have time to play with the Play-Doh and discover how the colors mix. Finally, I will tell the students that they will listen to a story about three mice and how much fun they have playing with different colors. So notice what I've done here. I've given them some hands-on, interesting activity to do. Who doesn't love to mix Play-Doh? And that's important background knowledge because in the story, the mice mix colors together. So if children don't have any experience in mixing colors, they're not really going to understand this story very well. So I've also linked it to something they've used before. My kids have all used Play-Doh before, so now I know that they have experience with that. I'm pulling in that background knowledge, giving them some, some new knowledge that they need to understand the story, and I'm doing it in an exciting, hands-on, multi-sensory way. I also try to give them a purpose for listening to the story. I tell them it's about three mice and that they play with different colors. So this is the hook. This is the hook. This introduction gets them hooked on the story and then um, hopefully they'll get excited and be able to understand it better. All right, now let's go to the procedures. First, I'm going to tell the story using laminated cutouts. 
I will stop at the appropriate points and ask them to predict what color will result from the mixture. This is really simple procedures. Sometimes your procedures will be a whole page or two. But here I'm just storytelling. So I've got the laminated cutouts already. That's what was in my materials section. So I'm just going to tell the story and stop and ask them questions. Now, I've, because this is a storytelling, I've also added this section on closure. At the end of the story, I'm going to ask the following questions. Maybe some of them I'll throw in during the story. And I'm using Bloom's taxonomy here. What are the animals in the story? How many mice were in the story? What's the first letter in the word mouse and mice? Because that was one of my objectives. Remember that. What sound does the letter M make? What's the difference between the words mouse and mice? Um, might as well throw in a little vocabulary activity there. Uh, did your colors mix the same way the colors in the story did? Why do you think the mice mixed the colors? How else can we mix the colors? Is this a true story? Can mice really play with colors? So I've tried to get some higher level critical thinking questions in there, as well as some lower level comprehension questions to make sure that they're understanding the story. Okay, after the closure, we're going to go to guided practice. Because this is preschool, I've set up the guided practice as centers. Guided practice could be as a whole group, it could be one-on-one, -on -one, it could be in guided reading groups, but because, again, this is a preschool lesson, I decided that during center time the children would have um, some follow-up activities. So in the art center, they're going to be painting, and, uh, well, I'll read this. I will divide the children into groups of three, like the three mice in the story, and on a large sheet of white paper will be puddles of yellow, blue, and red paint and I will instruct the students to use their two fingers as mouse feet to dance in the puddles like the mice in the story. The students will then be asked how they made the new colors and will be encouraged to create as many new colors as they want and when dry the pictures will be hung on the wall. So this is a follow-up to the story that is focused a little bit more on, on science, on mixing colors, but it also directly relates to co comprehending what the mice were doing in the, in the book. In the writing center, the students will be asked to think about words that start like mouse and mice and write them on the paper, drawing a picture and underlining the letter M for each word. The teacher will give the students red, yellow, and blue mouse-shaped paper with the letter M written on it and ask them to draw pictures of objects that start with the letter M. I will also encourage them to write the words to label their pictures, or for those who need it, I will write it for them. It's a really good idea somewhere in your lesson plan to have modifications for children who are either struggling at a lower level or who are either um, at a higher level, maybe they have met some of the objectives of the lesson already. So always be sure, always be thinking, how can I individualize? How can I create modifications for, or adaptations for children who need it? Finally, I will check for understanding. I will use anecdotal records to evaluate which students have met the objectives. Now I'm using anecdotal records because that's typical in preschool. Often they're required as part of other preschool evaluation systems. So y you know you need to know your setting a little bit and what's appropriate for the age level. I'm going to check with my anecdotal records to see who showed interest and pleasure in the story by mixing the Play-Doh and participating in the storytelling. And I'm going to look at who were able to identify the letter M and the sound it makes. Now, hopefully you'll notice that these phrases right here came from my objectives. In fact, I just cut and pasted them. I went back to my objectives, I cut, I pasted it in here, and I created a new sentence. I just flipped it around. Are they able to do these things? So, that's it. That's the end of creating a good lesson plan. Hopefully you've understood that. If you have any questions, of course, I'm free at any time to help you get better at your lesson planning.